David Benedict, you are a huge inspiration to me as a recently and rather reluctant uh, um, newbie to the world of online music uh, creation. <laughs> and I started doing it, right? And then I found you on YouTube. Now, I had known of you anyway, but uh, you, you're, the, the content that you're creating for Mandolin is phenomenally good. Oh, and it's been a oh. huge source of inspiration for me. And I'll just say that right off the bat. Um, oh, thanks, man. You're married to a lovely lady called Tabitha, who I did meet many years ago uh, when she was playing and, and still does, I believe, with a, a band called Cup of Joe. Mm. Now, this is going to sound like semi-rude. Were you there when I met Tabitha? <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I um Tabitha and I met first at IBMA in Raleigh, North Carolina. I guess it was 2017. And then I just started getting to know her long distance. Um and I was living in Boston at the time, so it was pretty easy to go over for a few days and get back um with, without dropping a thousand dollars or something like that on on airfare. But uh uh I don't think I was there though. When when was that that you met her? Definitely before 2017. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe it was at an event in Dublin that was hosted by um, a big uh, company out of Kentucky that does, oh, oh they do. Uh, yeah, Wood Songs, right? I heard about oh, that. Yeah, it was when Wood Songs traveled and it was hosted by this, oh my God, my, my brain is uh, jet lagged still, but it was a massive company, Irish Brother, who was uh, had his base in Kentucky and it was equine medication, essentially. Oh really? That's yeah. so interesting. And they were they were launching a a huge kind of a, a food business to to this huge empire, and that that's where we met Tabitha. Yeah, yeah. that's so yeah. funny. Yeah, she was just telling me about that recently, right? Because Paul Brady was there too, and we banjo three, and it sounded yeah. like a really fun event, man. We were just I don't know if it'll happen, but we've been trying to figure out a way to play wood songs while we're going through Kentucky um, on a tour coming up in May. But um, that's such an awesome production, man. I've never been to it before, but I've seen so many videos over the years of like amazing artists playing there. It's cool. It's real old style. You know, Michael that runs it, um, he has a foot pedal that flashes up applause, you know, so it's like something straight out of the <laughs> 60s that you imagine American TV with the applause and the audience all applause, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That That's is really cool. Do it, man. I yeah. need one of those for my videos. Just like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need the one that turns off all of the hiss and the echo in the room and all this kind of stuff, man. I'm, I've am i been running to catch up now for a year. And I, I have a little guitar behind me. And uh, yeah, I was here two weeks ago and, and I, I was recording and there was this crazy boom happening in the room. And I went and I put mutes on all the banjos. And the, the guitar was hanging where the mandolin is right now. And I couldn't figure out. And I brought my son in. He's Matthew. He's 13. I was like, where is this boom? And he walks <laughs> up to the, the guitar and he goes, oh, it's here, dad. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I spent an hour, like, you know, putting panels all over the place. and everything. He just took the guitar off the wall and that was the end of it. So. Uh, young years, man. I'm, we're getting old. <laughs> so where are you from? Yeah, I um I grew up here in South Carolina. That's where we're living right now. Um, I was born in a town called Columbia, and then my folks moved to a university town called Clemson when I was six, and they're still there. So that's where I, I grew up. And um, and like there was tons of music around me. I don't know. I I didn't really get into music till later on, but looking back, there were so many amazing mandolin players and bluegrass players and even Irish players nearby that. Um, I wish I'd taken advantage of more when I was when I was growing up, but it's been fun being back here. We moved back to South Carolina, I guess, about two or three years ago now. And um, we're living in the upstate kind of near Asheville, North Carolina as well, which is really nice. Lots of cool stuff happening there. Mm, it's a great town. Lo love it. So when did you actually get into music and were your parents musical? Was there music in the family? A little bit, yeah. My dad played drums in a jazz combo, like a just a local jazz band when I was growing up. He played when he was in high school and did jazz band in school and all that stuff. And um, he gave it up. I think he sold his drum kit to help pay for my folks' honeymoon after they got married. And then um, my mom surprised him and bought like a cheap drum set for an anniversary when I was maybe like 11 or 12. And that was my first time getting to hear him play. Um, so that definitely sparked an interest. They would play like at the local sushi shop downtown 
Clemson on a monthly basis and you know play odd gigs and I would tack along and be my dad's drum tech uh, on a few occasions, which was fun. Um, and then at the time, I think we heard um, maybe Nickel Creek on NPR or something like that. And there's a record store downtown Clemson within walking distance. So my dad stopped there, I think on his way home from work one time, picked up that first record that they did, the self-titled one at least. And um, that was my first introduction into like acoustic music and got me interested in playing. Um, so I actually took like jazz guitar lessons first from the guitar player in my dad's band because we didn't really know anyone else to ask. So I was like, I had a little nylon string acoustic guitar that I was, I didn't, I didn't know how to play with the flat pick. So I just used my thumb and I like first couple weeks of my time playing guitar, I had like a, a blister the size of a quarter on my thumb because I didn't know how to play or, or, or what to, what to do with my right hand for a long time. Um, and, but you know, it was fun. I, I, I progressed a little bit on the guitar, but didn't really catch on to it. And after a couple of years dropped it until my dad brought home a mandolin just as a surprise when I was 13 and, um, you know, was listening to that Nickel Creek album a lot and, um, started playing actually with an Irish band that was local because that was the only, only other musicians that I really knew besides the, the jazz folks my dad was playing with. So that was kind of my introduction was playing fiddle tunes with those folks, which was really fun. So did you find the mandolin uh, difficult? Was it, uh, you know, so my experience with mandolin, right, uh, as a banjo player, is that mandolin is often a second instrument. But in Ireland, there's a ton of really bad mandolins, right? <laughs> <laughs> and if it's, it kind of goes from terrible, 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 expensive. And an expensive mandolin is playable. And all the terrible ones are like really difficult to play. Whereas you can get an awful lot out of a $500 banjo or a 500 euro banjo, but you're really banging your head against the wall. In my in my experience with a $500 mandolin. So I'm wondering like, what were the early days like? Or did you even notice at 13? Yeah, I, um, I didn't know, you know, what a good mandolin was for sure when I first started out. But the one I started out with, I think was actually okay in hindsight. I don't have it anymore, which I'm really sad about. I, um, I lent it out to someone and we moved to different places and I've lost touch with them. So I don't know where it is in the world right now, but um, it was a $300 a model Alvarez mandolin. And I don't think they make those anymore, but my dad just, it was like one of the two mandolins that the local music store had. And he just bought the cheapest one, I think. Um, but I, I know I had a pretty decent time with it for the first, I don't know how, how many years, like maybe four or five years I played on that thing. And I was just playing pretty casually at the time. And, wasn't that serious about playing music, but, um, but yeah, it, it stayed in tune for the most part, which was the most important thing. And the action wasn't too high. Um, I think I did, I didn't know how to change the strings for the first like three or four years of my time with the mandolin. I think the first time I tried, I didn't realize that you're supposed to take off, off just one string at a time and that the, <laughs> you know, the bridge would move if I took them all off. So I just, I stripped them all off and there's like, had no idea how to place the bridge afterwards. So we just, after that, took it into the local music store and paid like 50 bucks for them to change the strings for us. Um, uh, but yeah, it was it was a pretty decent instrument starting out. And um, I guess I didn't really know, uh, I don't know, I, I wasn't as enthralled with the guitar for some reason, something about the mandolin just felt like really comfortable and really natural. And I like that, um, I guess there weren't a whole lot of other mandolin players in the music circles that I walked in. So it gave more opportunities to play with other people. Um, like local singer songwriters or this Irish band that didn't have a mandolin player at the time. So that was kind of a way for me to get my foot in the door with folks. Um, but I never, I don't remember actually making a conscious decision to make like the mandolin my main instrument, if that makes sense. And um, I, looking back, I probably would have benefited from playing other instruments like, you know, tenor banjo and guitar more. I wish I had. Um, but I was just talking to uh, Marla Fibish recently. She was talking about how like a lot of folks over in Ireland, you know, play the mandolin kind of as a auxiliary instrument, which I think is really cool. Like having it just in your arsenal um, because there, are, there aren't as many mandolin players out there. There's always going to be like more guitar players out there. I feel like, especially in the States and um, just having that in your back pocket is worthwhile, man. It op opens up so many doors for sure. Uh, would you be aware then that like in Ireland, it's, unusual for Irish music to be played on what we would consider a bluegrass style F or even the A style that, you know, 
and I never heard the word, uh, what, what do you call it? The paddle mandolin or? Right. Or the, the pancake mandolin. Yeah. Well, that's even a new term. I hadn't heard that one. Oh, before, really? Yeah. 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 I've always, you know, heard it because it's kind of shaped like a pancake, you know, just like flat back and front. Um, yeah. I, um, I was thinking about that recently. I would really love to have like a, a more proper Irish mandolin because I still love playing those tunes and would love to get more into it. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I don't know of too many folks who use like an F model mandolin to play Irish music. I guess like maybe Lara Beth Salter would be the only person I really know who does that kind of stuff up in Scotland. Um, do you know of any other folks who, who use like an F style? No, I mean, Mar Martin Howley in our band does, but then he does a lot of chopping as well. And, right. and of course, you, you can't really get that same woody chop from an Irish style mandolin. But yeah, so most kids or most people that would play mandolin in Ireland are playing it on. And it, you've got much more of that klezmer uh, style tone that comes off it. Yeah, definitely, man. That's another style of music I'd love to get into at some point. I love like listening to Andy Statman. And um, I heard he just did like a, a recent collaboration with Ken Perlman, like doing all sorts of klezmer stuff. And um, that's just such a beautiful style of music. And I, yeah, the tone that you can get out of those like the pancake mandolins or even just like the the oval hole mandolins um just like a richness to the sustain that i'm jealous of you know mostly playing you know an f5 mandolin myself um so i, I don't know every once in a while i'll go on the mandolin cafe and look at the classifieds and see if there's any good deals but we just bought a house recently so i, I don't know i'm just trying to not spend too much money <laughs> besides what we spend on our mortgage at the minute but <laughs> so did you go did you eventually take um like formal mandolin lessons and where did your knowledge will say of music theory and chord theory and bluegrass theory which i'm always really impressed with that irish musicians can get to a phenomenal level of technical ability and lyrical ability and tune interpretation and the you know the, the entire package many of them without reading a note without having any knowledge whatsoever of you know scales chords arpeggios triads all of that and when i mean I, i've written two books in the banjo and when i did the chord um <laughs> as i called it the chord chapter uh i nearly had a nervous breakdown as i tried to you know <laughs> understand chord theory and then apply it to double string chords in a banjo so that people who had no knowledge of it whatsoever could make sense of it i've, I've never written anything as hard can you oh, even yeah. remember to start this question? Yeah, no, I totally get what you're you're coming from. And I um I think when I first started out, the only learning resource I had and um like even taking guitar lessons, most of that theory I was trying to learn was going way over my head. So I didn't really absorb much of it besides just like the E pentatonic scale. That was my go-to, man. I just knew that one scale and would play it over every song, no matter what key. Um, just with my thumb, my blistered thumb, you know. Um, but when I came to the mandolin, my my main source of education was from tab books, just because I didn't know who to take lessons from at the time. Even though there were great mandolin players nearby, like Sean Lane from the band Blue Highway was just like a 30 minutes drive from us. Um, I didn't even know who Blue Highway was at the time, just because I didn't listen to much bluegrass growing up. And my parents didn't really know much about the, the music either. And I didn't have any friends who were really into the music. So it was a the slow learning process but um yeah i remember the first book i had was this book called mandolin primer which i think is just like the it might be the most ubiquitous mandolin book tab book out there just because it's the one book that most music stores have if they have a mandolin in stock they're, they're going to sell that book to you as well and um i forget who like put it out it's like maybe brad laird or something like that um but there was just fiddle tunes in it, like red haired boy and blackberry blossom and stuff like that and they showed you how to play the chop chord probably within the first few pages which is you know kind of a crazy stretch for someone just starting out but um i didn't think much about the theory until i guess i was starting to get more serious about wanting to play music later on in high school i'd only been playing mandolin for you know seriously for a couple of years and um i was just you know getting more into it and it was getting time to Think about going to college my folks you know set that expectation for me which i'm glad and i was like i have no idea what i want to major in. maybe i'll just major in in music and i didn't play anything else besides the mandolin at the time and i realized that if i wanted to study music i probably needed to learn some music theory so thankfully at the time um i was homeschooled you know which, which you know it's actually awesome i really 
appreciate my my folks for being willing to do that just because it left a lot more time and freedom for me to pursue stuff like music so i think it was like my junior year in high school here i was able to go to a local community college and start taking classes for dual credit and um, there was a college nearby that offered a, a music theory class which i had no experience in it whatsoever um, but just for an experiment you know my parents were kind of trying to persuade me not to pursue music. He's like, maybe you should do a business degree and minor in music or something like that, or maybe do a dual major. Um, but, you know, they were willing to let me try stuff out and see if I had a knack for it or enjoyed it. And um, they signed me up for this music theory class. And I took like the first two semesters of college music theory in high school and just loved it. But at the, at the time, like when I first started out, they had like a, I remember an entrance exam or a, like a, I forget what they call it, you know, basically to, to test how much theory you knew going into the class and you had to identify key signatures and write out scales. I couldn't read music at all. I had no idea what a key signature was. So I was like starting at square one, but for some reason, just learning all that felt really invigorating and exciting because you felt like you had a, a way of identifying something or putting a name to a certain sound that you're hearing and being able to replicate it when you're playing too. So I, I don't know not starting out as a theory player coming to theory later on i feel like was an amazing experience even though i know it can be a stressful intimidating experience for other people but um it's always been a useful thing to me to feel like i can categorize the sounds that i'm hearing and use that categorization as a way of um i don't know using those sounds in, in my playing um has, has that been your experience do you feel like well it seems like it's it's much more important in bluegrass music because of the what's the word i'm looking for uh you know kind of the idea of taking breaks and doing doing solos and stuff that you you because you, because you're doing more than just playing the tune right so again in irish music 10 people get together they all play the tune they're all varying the tune ever so slightly sometimes together sometimes individually but they're not kind of going off for one entire round of the tune where it comes around to there and they're like, woohoo, I'm going to go and impress everybody. And now I need to know <laughs> a bunch of arpeggios because if you did that in Irish music, people would probably stop you and say, somebody wrote a tune here. We might stick to it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I, I mean, I can play, you know, hours and hours of Irish music and have no need to understand chord theory. Uh, uh, clearly, it's good to know what key you're in so that you can shout at the guitar player when they're backing you in the wrong key, right? But... Mm -hmm. Uh, but you don't need to know the the that whole arpeggio world. But that's obviously very important in bluegrass music. That's what I'm kind of picking up as an outsider who's trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Yeah, I'd say even too, like, I, that makes total sense. You, you kind of just learn the tools necessary for the musical community that you find yourself in when you're starting out. And when, um, when I was starting out, I guess I was playing a lot with singer songwriters nearby. Um, sometimes even more so than like this Irish band that I sat in with. Um, so it, it became necessary. I didn't really know most of the songs that they were playing before the gig. So like noodling became a way of life and you just start figuring out certain things. Like I, I think I started playing arpeggios before I knew what an arpeggio was or how it lined up with the chord or, you know, would learn a scale before I knew what a scale was or a pentatonic scale before I knew what that, that word was too. Um, and just by way of necessity, you know, started inventing things or started experimenting with stuff. Uh, but I wish I'd had more of like a melodic centering, honestly, like being able to hear a tune, not know like the key that it's in, but still be able to play it by ear. Like, like you guys can do, it's just incredible. It's like, I have no idea how folks do that growing up when they're first getting started. It's amazing. Hmm. So have you played Irish sessions then? You said you, like you mentioned playing with an Irish band, but so what was the, what was the makeup of the band and what kind of stuff were you doing? Yeah, we, um, let's see, it was a band called Emerald Road and it was kind of based around, uh, these two sisters who'd studied Irish music a little bit and, um, they'd been over to Ireland before and, and done some, I think some workshops and classes and sessions of, out there. Um, so they played, fiddle and uh cello and and bar on a little bit and like uh some some irish whistle too and then it was also a few other folks that were rotating members there was a guitar player um a guy who played some percussion and, and whistle as well and um then i played mandolin 
and a little bit of tenor banjo, very little. I borrowed it from one of the guitar players, uh, a tenor banjo for about eight months when I was playing with them, which was really fun um, just because it felt like the mandolin, but I could actually hear it when I was playing with the band, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, for sessions, I don't know. Like I've not done as much as I would like. Um, like we would do, you know, just kind of fun sessions for rehearsals where we would try to learn tunes that other players in the band were learning and just play them for fun, uh, not on stage. Um, and then I've been to maybe one or two sessions in in Ireland when I've been over just visiting um, with Tabitha. We went to one actually near Galway. I forget exactly where it was we were staying, but um, it was just a beautiful little session with um, a lot of Irish flutes. Um, I didn't even break out my mandolin just because I was like enjoying listening to it too much. And most of the tunes I didn't know as well. So I didn't want to make a fool of myself. But um, I'd say my repertoire is very limited. That's the the main setback for me. Um, I, I, I would love to learn more, honestly. Um, but someone told me like, I don't know if it's true. Would you feel like this is the case that you have to know like at least 3000 tunes to be able to keep up with half the, the tunes that people play in sessions? Well, I heard a statistic that the average Irish musician would know 4,000 tunes and would be able mm. to but recall a thousand of them. I don't know. I don't know. I've never counted. I think after 10 years of playing with We Banjo 3, I can safely remember seven tunes that aren't in the band. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, amazing, man. But the repertoire so you were, is huge. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, when, when you were learning, like, would you try to learn like a new tune every day or did you have like a, a system for learning stuff or you just just go for it kind of i was lucky that my older brother collected tunes so we, we would go to a competition and there'd be a lot of sessions that would happen over the weekend or we would go to a week-long festival uh and he would bring a, a little tape recorder and he would record and then when he got back to the piano he would notate and so he was he was collecting tunes from a young age so he was playing yeah. away on the piano now i had none of his education our concentration skills. I was the guy that was running around, you know, banging into things and causing havoc. But, <laughs> but I was picking up all of the tunes by ear. So that's why I can never remember the name of a single tune, because I don't really ever recall sitting down and going, OK, now I'm going to learn the spotted pig or whatever, you know, <laughs> I'd be like, that sounds very like a tune I already know. <laughs> I have no idea where I learned it, learned it from. And I, I may not have the correct second part, you know, so I was very much a an immersion uh, learner. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I was playing from the age of eight and nine. And when I was 11, I was playing professionally in a show and I had to I had to learn tunes for that. But then I was just learning them usually from a tape or from or from music. So, yeah, by 15 or 16, thousands of tunes, tens of thousands yeah. of hours played and when you're doing it natively like that, I think it's a lot easier than sure. now if I was to sit down and go, right, I'm going to learn a tune. If it's not like strictly within the kind of basic modes of Irish music. So a lot of modern composed tunes are, they got bendy bits in it and I'd have to mm -hmm. really concentrate and go, what? Yeah. It's, not, it's not going where it's supposed to be going. <laughs> Oh man, I tried to learn that mystery inch tune from Damien on his record. That one, oh my goodness, is it? It's actually straight, but it's not, isn't it? I tried to figure it out one time, but yeah, that's that's one uh, of those because this. I mean, I assume it's the same in bluegrass. Like, there's modes, there's mm -hmm. there's phrases that fit into all tunes. A lot of them dismount in a similar way, uh, but a lot of the new stuff, like what Damien O'Kane is writing, are they're, they're very crooked, and you have to pay attention. That's my, I think my favorite type of tunes. And it's cool, like even thinking back to some of the early American fiddle tunes, um, like some of the old time stuff that still gets played now, is that they're so crooked that it almost makes them sound more modern and more complex than some of the the basic bluegrass tunes that you play nowadays, like like Blackberry Blossom and and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I was, I was learning one kind of recently. It was called boys them buzzards are flying have you heard that one no. <laughs> and that the most fantastic name for a fiddle tune ever <laughs> but it's so crooked i don't i i had tried to count it out one time i don't know if i ever figured it out i just you know some crooked tunes you just almost have to learn the melody be able to sing it back and feel the rhythm rather than counting it um but i think that one's that one's done 
that one may not be that old. I think it's written by a guy named Gary Harrison who wrote that Red Prairie Dawn tune that's kind of been more popular in bluegrass scenes recently. Um, but yeah, some of those crooked ones are so good. So, you know, you mentioned kind of early inspiration being Nickel Creek, uh, which is clearly like really accessible, brilliant, poppy bluegrass music. Uh, and then you're doing, a, you're doing a major in, I assume it's kind of general music as opposed to a major in bluegrass music. Yeah, I um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to study and music specifically. Um, so I ended up doing more of a broader degree. Actually, I did a performance degree, which is kind of weird. And some, for some reason, the college that I ended up going to, it was, um, it was a very small liberal arts school called Bryan College near Chattanooga, Tennessee. And um, the music department was tiny. It was like probably 90 people, 90 students all together. And the student body, you know, was probably eight or 900 people all together. Um, so it was small enough to kind of let me run rampant and do whatever I wanted to without much, <laughs> you know, without much, uh, you know, people checking up on me to make sure I was doing my work, which was kind of great. Um, so I ended up taking lessons from Matt Flinner for most of my time in college. And that was, um, that was my main mandolin type of education, I'd say. And the rest of the stuff I did was just general kind of classic music theory for semesters of music history, music theory. Um, I took a lot of classes looking back now, I feel like may have just been a waste of time, but you know, it was, it was good. And it kind of gave me a safe space for a few years just to figure out who I wanted to be musically and um, get exposed to a lot of weird music and um, and just to practice, honestly. Like the coolest thing about the college was that they had a closet in the music department that was empty. And the head of the music department just knew I liked to practice a lot. And he gave me a key to the closet. And he's like, you can use this as a practice room if you want to. So I had my own room in the music building and no one else had that privilege, which was pretty amazing. Um, so I just would lock myself away and, and go for it. Um, and you didn't even know it was soundproofed. <laughs> uh, it actually wasn't. It was actually a terrible situation because it was right next to a piano practice room. And they just had cement block walls separating the rooms, but the, the roof or the ceiling of the rooms were just ceiling tiles and there's just space above it connecting all the other practice rooms together. So you heard every note that everyone else was playing in those practice rooms nearby. But so when, do. When, when did you start to develop then uh, like an awareness of the legacy of bluegrass music? Yeah, definitely through Flinner, I'd say he was um, a huge inspiration and um, just his music alone too I mean, was a was a big eye-opening experience all the stuff he's done with his solo albums and also with his trio like his music du jour thing i don't know if you've heard about that like where he and his trio when they're touring each member of the trio will write a new tune the day of the show to perform at the show that night so they have to like write it rehearse it and perform it all in one day which is absolutely terrifying and i'm sure will be so uh nerve wracking on tour to have to write a new tune every day. But um, yeah, I mean, like learning his stuff and then he, you know, got me into like Dave Grisman's music and he got me into um, like Bela Fleck, honestly. Like I'd, I'd seen Bela Fleck play a couple times, but didn't really know his his uh, catalog. And um, I remember the, the lesson, he was like, you should listen to this album called Drive. And I was like, what? I've not heard this one before. Um, and then the next week I was like, oh, this is so good. Give me more. And it's like, okay, go check out the Bluegrass Sessions, uh, you know, volume two of Tales from the Acoustic Planet. And um, those two albums in particular were, were just absolutely, um, you know, mind bending and 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 earth shattering, uh, so to speak, at near Sam Bush on those tunes in particular. We just saw him this past week. He and Mike Marshall came and played um, with uh edgar meyer and his son george meyer at a place here in greenville south carolina and um it's funny like sam bush in particular he looks a little bit like my dad <laughs> and <laughs> i kind of look at him almost as if he's like a, a mandolin father figure of sorts um especially with his work uh with bela fleck uh, but also you know like that that record that they did the short trip home record um which was some of the music that they were playing this past week was really influential to me and strength in numbers too. Um, that, but then that also, was, you, that, was oh, my, yeah. that was my first bluegrass record. No so way. Was, yeah, it started Holy at the top. Cow, <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that, honestly. Yeah, some of those tunes are, are 
weird. They're so wacky, but so fun. And um, just the playing is phenomenal. Um, love to see that band play live at some point. Never got to. But uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, Flinter kind of opened up my eyes to a lot. And I'm still, I still feel very uneducated um, on a lot of fronts with the mandolin legacy and history, like you were saying. Like um, when I was living in Nashville, I took a few lessons from Mike Compton, which was really amazing. And getting to hear his stories of playing with John Hartford and um, his stories of hanging out with Bill Monroe, because Mike's such a amazing, you know, uh, proponent of the modern day Monroe style. Um, that was really fun. He, he gave me these transcriptions that I still have like in a box somewhere here at the house of note for note, uh, transcriptions of Monroe stuff, like with all the variants and all the, the details written out as specific as possible, which was kind of, um, a, you know, eye opening to me just cause I didn't know Monroe style was so detailed and so oriented like that. Um, so that, I mean, there's so much that I, I need to go back and, and revisit. Um, I, I, I mean, there's all sorts of other influences too. Like, um, like Adam Steffi was a big influence. I remember a friend in high school, uh, actually got me into that bluegrass 95 record. Have you ever heard that one? No. It's so funny. It's like, um, it, it sounds like when I was growing up, they had the wow CDs. I don't know if you ever heard of those. It was like, wow, 1998. <laughs> and it was like all the hits from that year, the pop hits. And it almost seemed like they were trying to do that with bluegrass for a while. Although I hear the story was like, it's, um, Clay Jones was the guitar player on that. And uh, it was supposed to be a solo album, but they you know, didn't have enough funding to make it a solo album. So a record label bought it and they just put Bluegrass 95 on the on the top. Um, but it was basically, you know, Union Station. It was like Barry Bales on bass and Adam Steffi was playing mandolin and Aubrey Haney was doing fiddle and Scott Vessel was doing banjo stuff. Um, and they just played fiddle tunes. It was like, temperance reel and whiskey before breakfast and goodbye lies jane um i think wayne benson played on a few tracks as well which is really cool so hearing you know those those guys was really amazing and then at the time when i was picking up the mandolin it was i feel like it was just when berkeley was starting to do like their american roots program i remember seeing videos of like sierra hole and jacob jolliffe before he had the long hair and um <laughs> who else it was uh Rick Robertson and um, a few other folks who were studying at Berkeley, seeing videos of them. And Sarah Rose was, you know, she had just released her first album when I was picking up the mandolin. Um, all those folks, Dominic Leslie too. Um, I felt like a really exciting time to be playing the mandolin. And it still is, you know, cause I feel like it keeps growing and growing. Um, yeah, I don't know. What was your first experience with the mandolin? I'm curious. I mean, my first experience was playing mandolin as a second instrument when we'd go to the Flakiol, which is the Irish music competitions. And so you could enter in multiple different uh, instruments. So banjo was my main instrument. I started it when I was eight years old. Uh, yeah, so that was mandolin was always like this was the paddle, the Irish mandolin kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I did own an a, a, a Collings A style for a while, but I never really jived with the heavy pick bluegrass style I didn't, I didn't get an i didn't spend enough time with it and it's such a different physical picking technique to the irish banjo because mm -hmm. with the mandolin it always felt like you're kind of gracing the strings whereas with right. irish banjo you there's a little bit more hitting going on in order to to make the note and i, I never gave it enough time maybe it's something i should i should go back to but then i would just you know i take it up I would listen to Sierra Hull and then I just go, right, I just need to put this back in the case because <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't enough time. <laughs> oh man, you're so amazing at the mandolin. I don't know what you're talking about. Like that video that you did uh, for the Mandolin Monday series recently, it was just phenomenal, man. I don't know how you do those triplets. But it's uh, like, I'm playing it like, I, I'm playing it Irish style. So I'm playing it like an, like an Irish banjo with a slightly lighter pick and definitely, you know, and then just digging in and you got that whole kind of klezmer sound that's coming off it because you got it, it really sounds like you got all these double strings that are going you know and what, I do, so what what type of pick do you use i'm curious if you, if you don't mind getting real nerdy about it on on, on the mandolin i think oh uh, you see on, on banjo i'm using currently there's a string joy i made in nashville and so 
for banjo, I would use a 0. 0.50 or a 0. 0.60. Okay. I have emailed them and said, for Irish banjo, we need a 0. 0.55. Because <laughs> the 0. 0.6 is just too heavy and the 0. 0.5 is too light. And they said, thanks very much. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I wish I was a little bit more famous so that they would uh. make a 0. 0.55. And Everybody that I know that plays the string joys are like, they're awesome. But if only they had a 0.55, it would be perfect. Oh, that's tragic, man. So I would probably use something like uh, on the mandolin, something like a 0.7 or maybe a 0.8. Now, I do have like 1.0s and all of this. But again, it's it's that kind of. Anyway, yeah, the, I'm just used to that slightly lighter pick and a little bit more digging in than uh than the grazing that that i see on mandolin players yeah i get that man i am i'm jealous in a lot of ways like when i was playing that tenor banjo with that irish band growing up i did use i don't know exactly which which millimeter was it's like 0. 0.60 or 0. 0.70 or something like that it was thinner than what i was used to like with the mandolin i probably used like a 1.4 or 1.5 most times or 1.3 sometimes but yeah, if it, it feels so good and you no, know, it like makes those articulations um just really pop. And um I, I haven't done as much of it on the mandolin as I'd like to though. I'd be fun just to experiment some and 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 play around with the thinner pick sometimes. I know I was talking to Marla too. She I guess she uses uh like a one millimeter pick, which I know is kind of different than a lot of folks who focus on Irish mandolin. But um yeah, it's an interesting world. It does make a huge difference. Yeah, I mean, my closest insight to it was Mark Martin Howley that plays We Banjo 3 because he was a banjo player to start out with and we would use the same picks. And then he started playing mandolin in the band, but he started off with a paddle mandolin um, and then and then he bought a, a Collings F style. And that was the transition. And it was over many years that he, he developed that really nice chop sound, but mm -hmm. also the really light touch and he worked you know martin is a real practicer and a real worker i'm yeah <laughs> i'm in the hole digging the hole before i figured out if it's in the right place kind of thing you know whereas <laughs> martin martin is amazing for doing like really incredible preparation and then really you know and accumulate loads of knowledge and then practice it very methodically you know whereas i'm just like ah! <laughs> you know? so I, I would have observed with him over the years how his picking technique in the mandolin was so different to the banjo with the heavier pick and he would talk about how much more satisfying it was to play mandolin because the subtleties of the tone from this really light the really light touch and that the, the banjo always felt a little bit agricultural in comparison <laughs> i don't know about my, that my <laughs> words my words not his <laughs> <laughs> i i think i've heard him talk about um you know how the scale length comes into factor a lot too with like the shorter strings on the mandolin some, you know, it's harder to get a nice sound with a thinner pick, whereas with the longer scale length on the banjo, you just have a lot more flex in the strings, which makes the the tack a little bit more round and really nice and dark. So yeah, it's I, it's the weirdest instrument because, like, Chris Thiele said that the mandolin is a very inefficient instrument, and I think it was in terms <laughs> of the the physicality and then the output. And I would say that the banjo is multiple multiple levels of inefficiency <laughs> what you get out because when you if you have claw hammer uh, five string banjo and and you touch the strings and there's this glorious resonant tone that comes from it and then irish banjo you hit it and it goes bloop and stops <laughs> <laughs> and of course you can do you know they're all unique in their own in their own right but it's, it's funny I, I all these years later i'm still like I'm a. I'm going to find the perfect banjo, and B. I'm going to master a whole load of more techniques and eventually get good at it. You know, do you do you feel the same way about ma about mandolin? Like, are you are you constantly aiming to improve, to 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 sharpen your technique, to learn new things? I watched a maybe uh, I can't remember who it was recently. It was I, I was on this I went down a picking rabbit hole of up release down release down escape pick and stuff oh, you know yeah and i came across some video of a guy who just reinvented a whole different way of picking so that there was one riff that he wanted to do in a in a solo that he couldn't do until he did it you know 
how how much into the weeds do you get with all of that stuff? <laughs> That's so funny. I I just heard about those phrases recently. Um, I I think I'd heard about the idea before I knew about the terms, but um, I've heard um a, a lot of folks when they're playing fast on the mandolin will use. I guess they call it the down escape where um, you always change a string on an upstroke, um, which is interesting. I, I don't know like the physics of why that works, but it does seem to be the case from like the, the few up-tempo like mandolin solos that I've tried to tra transcribe from like Dealey or Steffi or whoever. Um, but then some people don't pay attention to that. Like I don't think really Sam Bush does that. Um, other folks as well. And I don't know if it's an intentional decision either. I wonder if it's just like, you know, they've worked out licks that seem to work faster um, and they just play those licks um, or those melodic ideas. I don't get into the weeds as much as I should. And I, I don't know, I go through like seasons of times where I feel like really inspired to practice and get new stuff under my fingers. But um, I heard Joe Walsh put it this way, Joe K. Walsh, uh, who said that he just practices to put out fires basically. And I feel that way a lot now where it's like, you know, I'll just practice something for an upcoming tour for like a session or a video that I'm trying to make, which is good. I feel like um, maybe I don't practice as much as I did when I first started out when I had my own practice room at college, but it, it feels more purposeful now where it's like another thing I've heard like a lot of content creators talk about is this idea of show your work. Um, where the idea if you're not doing the work for the work's sake, you're doing the work to hopefully like bring meaning or bring enjoyment to other people's lives. And even just the idea of practicing for a, a video that I might put out um, like that, I feel like gives me more enjoyment in some ways, just because it feels like I can practice for a meaningful purpose of hopefully being able to show someone someone something useful or, some, or someone something fun that they can work on and continue to improve on in the mandolin. Or even just like um, practicing for a tour or for a gig, I, like I'm sure like you've done so much, like just um, it feels useful and feels like you're making progress in a in a meaningful way just because you're going to share that music with someone else. Whereas like it, it, I don't feel as inspired to like learn fiddle tunes anymore, which is sad because I, I love doing that growing up, like trying to expand my repertoire and um, just know all these obscure cricket tunes, but. Um, if I don't have a, an outlet for it, it doesn't feel like it has quite as much weight or quite as much um, value, uh, even though they are super fun, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about the band in a minute. Where where did the whole teaching aspect come from? And and now you've got this, you're like this huge output of mandolin content on, 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 your, on YouTube and on Instagram and a phenomenal quality incredible amounts of output and i know because i've started getting into video editing massive oh, effort well. in terms of edits and it's so polished but where, where did that i mean it, obviously it has grown organically as you've uh, as you've got 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 you know done more of it but where, where did the whole thing start yeah um well i started i guess i started teaching like private lessons in high school just a, a couple of friends who were interested in learning mandolin. Um, so teaching has always been a part of my experience with music. Um, and I guess like doing video lessons, that's been something a little bit more recent. Like I I, um, I guess it all started for, for me with this like Mandolin Monday series that I've been running for a while. And that was, I guess it was 2014 I started that. And I remember I just moved to Nashville and I didn't have any gigs or any you know, prospects of gigs. And I was twiddling my thumbs, not knowing what to do. So I like for a new year's resolution, I just started a YouTube channel and I was like, maybe I'll try to put out a new video every week on a Monday, call it mandolin Mondays. Cause a friend was like, you should, you should start something called mandolin Mondays. And so I stole his idea and just started doing this weekly video series. Um, and, uh, I guess another thing was that I, I'd learned how to use this program Finale when I was in school. That was like maybe one of the more useful tools that I, I acquired throughout my college degree um, and would figure out like a template for mandolin tablature and notation. Um, so I would try to work out a new song every week and transcribe it and post it uh, on my YouTube channel and shared it on the mandolin cafe on a blog I was running. And um, I don't know, I guess it just kind of picked up I don't know. I don't want to say like it picked up steam or a following because like the mandolin world's so small. It didn't really like it's not popular at all, and by any stretch of the mean of that word. But it's 
I don't know, it started to get a little bit of interest in the, the owner of the Mandalay Cafe website was very supportive and started sharing videos on the front page of the site. And, um, and I got through the whole year by some miracle, which was amazing. Every, every week posted something new. And, um, I got to the end of the year and I was like, I cannot do this anymore. It's way too much work. <laughs> and, and actually Joe K Walsh, I was, uh, I just moved up to Boston at the time and he was like, you should keep this going and just source it out to other mandolin players to, to do the work for you. <laughs> and, um, he was the first guest I, I roped him into it first and started doing, um, just, uh, guest features for, for the series. Uh, and so that was my introduction to making videos and to making content. And I didn't really think about it as a, as a main focus, hardly at all, but it was such a good experience at the beginning. Cause I felt like it gave me an incentive to practice and a way to show my work and a way to have a system for, um, accountability to practice, to work on something new. And, um, and it wasn't really until the pandemic that I started thinking about it more as a main focus, just because as we all, you know, lost gigs and I had to stay at home more looking for ways of being productive, a way of making music and sharing it with other people. So I started a Patreon page just because I saw Eli Gilbert doing it for, you know, banjo players and all the awesome videos that he was putting out at the time. And then also like lessons with Marcel. I just started watching his stuff a few years back and got really inspired by his content um, for guitar, bluegrass guitar. And um, I thought, you know, got a lot of time. We're actually in Northern Ireland at the, at the time, um, Tabitha had just gotten a Sony camera for fun to take some photos. So it's like, can I borrow this for a few hours? <laughs> See if I can make a video. And um, yeah, and that was the start of it. It, um, and it grew, it, it grew organically, like you're saying, which is really cool. Um, like the Patreon page, you know, became, you know, a, a really cool community of folks that I really enjoyed hanging out with and had like a discord server where, you know, we got to chat and I did like video exchange lessons with folks, kind of like what they do on artist works. And, um, yeah, there's just like a ton of awesome students who were really eager to learn. So I wanted to put out more content and thought, you know, if I could do it with mandolin Mondays, you know, I, I could probably do it with lessons as well and tried to put out, you know, new videos every week. Um, and it started slow, you know, like, uh, started as just kind of like a side thing, but then has slowly over the past couple of years turned into a main focus and something I, I try to, um, I don't know, try to put out output, uh, on a regular basis, if, if that makes sense. Like this year, I don't know. I, New Year's resolutions have been my my north star ever since Mandolin Monday. So like this year, I was I was thinking of what I could do to help my creative output, and so I'm trying to post something new on my social media pages, something Mandolin related every day this year if I can. I don't know if I can keep it up. I've been going strong so far for the first month and a half, but we'll see if I can keep it up. <laughs> How many hours a week do you spend on it? That's a good question. I haven't really counted it up, but um. It, it kind of comes and goes like for this month, um, I'm doing this thing where I'm posting like a new 60 minute fiddle tune lesson. And we're learning like a new fiddle tune every day for the month of February, fiddle tune February, we're calling it. Cause I love alliteration. And um, like that was probably a good week and a half of work. So maybe like, maybe between 40, 50 hours of work to create like 28 reels and the transcriptions and some guitar backing tracks for them and to, edit it all and schedule it. Um, but right, I mean, now I don't have anything to do, but just, you know, share it on my Facebook page every day, pretty much. Um, so it kind of comes and goes. And this year, I think it'll be, uh, you know, I'm trying to plan ahead just because we have some some touring and some traveling coming up. We're going over to Northern Ireland a few times for some family visits, some family weddings and stuff like that as well. So trying to stay on top of it where, you know, you have a, maybe a week and a half of really solid work in between tours and then um, it's kind of a system that can run itself while we're, we're gone. At least that's the plan. <laughs> so, like I said, we're going to talk about the band now. If you could choose, if if I, if if in the morning I said the ba the band is going to be successful and busy enough that it will be your full time job, or if you had to choose between the two, I mean, are, are, you know, does your heart call to one of them? You would say, God, I would love nothing more than to be on the road six, seven months of the year with the band and do Telluride and all the rest of it. Which one, <laughs> which one would your heart sing for? Oh, man, that's a good question. I need to ask myself that more often. Um, I don't know. I think. 
I think I would, if I had to choose one or the other. Oh man, you're putting me on the spot here. I don't know. I feel uh, bad now things, for asking because they're like, there's oh things my God. I love about both, but yeah, like I, I like traveling, but I don't, I don't love being away from home too much. Um, and part of the reason, like I, I stopped playing with um, this other band, Mile Twelve, was because I wanted to focus on you know being at home and being together with Tabitha, just because we just moved to the states and you know got married four years ago now. But uh, it wanted to just prioritize being together. And thankfully, with this this new project, the Foreign Landers, we we play together and we can be together most of the time, which is amazing. Um, so that that's really special. And also just making music with Tabitha is like one of my favorite things and getting to do that more. Um, so talk I, to me, know, talk, talk to me. Yeah. About, Cause even you album, right. And you've got touring coming up. Do. So I do want to hear about that. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, we recorded an album here at home last year and we, we named it after the new home town that we're living in now it's called travelers rest. And um, it just kind of made sense. Cause it, we, we have traveled so much in the past and living in a place here in tra called travelers rest seems almost like storybook um even though we still travel a lot and are still gone quite a lot um but it's a collection of original songs that kind of tell our story of coming to the states you know getting married waiting for the green card through the pandemic when things were so up in the air and immigration was delayed and we weren't, we weren't sure where we were going to live at the time but we just kind of found this place and um it was really special and meaningful so that i mean that's the gist of the band and the band is named after an old folk song called foreign lander which i was actually we just did some research on it it was um it was a song uh i think it was originally done by the ritchie family in kentucky and uh i don't know if you've heard of gene ritchie she was like a a, a really great songwriter singer and her mom it was edna ritchie and apparently this song was sung by i forget her husband's name, but it was sung by him to Edna kind of as a courting song about, you know, being originally from Scotland and having to travel across the ocean so much. So it's like that idea kind of captures the the whole meaning of the band, just being from different countries and um, trying to find a place to call home, even though it's hard and, you know, it's hard to find a place that we can both feel at home um, just because we're from such different places, but yet being together um, is even better than all that, if that makes sense. Um, so all I'd say, yeah, we recorded this album and we're going on tour this year, actually starting in a couple of weeks here where um, we're taking a couple extra musicians with us. We got Nate Sabat playing bass with us a lot this year and Julian Pinelli is going to be playing fiddle and um, we're traveling mostly around the Southeast this month and up in the Northeast in March and out West later this summer. So I don't know. I don't, I don't see us like, being a band that plays 200 dates a year, or even hundred dates a year, maybe. Um, I think the most I ever did with mile 12 was maybe like 121 year. And that felt like, a, I felt like a lot. And I can't even imagine what you guys do. What, how many gigs a year did you guys play like before the pandemic? We, we really didn't do any more than a hundred. So we, we said no more than five months uh, on tour split over mm -hmm. the course of the year. That was the max that we ever did. That's a pretty good balance, man. I, yeah. I just, that two words. We just made it look like we were never off tour. <laughs> You made it look real good too, man. I mean, it was uh, awesome. Awesome, David. My God, <laughs> it was. And we were so lucky. I mean, we hit such a curve and we, we hit such a peak of performance and the shows that we got to do in this last year, Rocky, Rocky Grass and Gray Fox and uh, just mind blown stuff. We finished our set in Rocky Grass and because we had kind of driven in and it's a big effort to get there because it's way up in Colorado. We didn't actually look at the lineup. And we finished our set. And as we're packing up, <laughs> Bela and and Edgar Meyer walk out on stage to get ready. They're on after us. Bela's like, nice <laughs> job, guys. And I was like, I'm so glad I didn't know you were backstage. Uh... I, would, I wouldn't have been able to play a note. I'd have been so nervous, you know. <laughs> oh, that's terrifying, man. He's so nice, though. Like, the few occasions I've, like, talked with him, he's just been so supportive. And, yeah, what an inspiration. Yeah, he's awesome, really man. And I, I I love Abigail even more. She's a force. Yeah. Of oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Like she's just she's so mindful and so purposeful in her music too. It's just incredible. Um but but yeah, to answer your question, I don't know which one I'd choose. I think like um I like a balance where, you know, like you don't have to travel all the time and 
but there's still there's something rewarding about being able to share your music in person with other people and being able to have that interaction and um being able to be creative in a live setting is different for sure but at the same time like i i enjoy like when i grew up i my first job was mowing grass and uh, me and my friend would just cut grass like all summer long and we got down there's this one lawn that we did that we got paid like 25 dollars for and we got it down to a science where we could do the whole thing in eight minutes and it was just so satisfying to be able to like see the work at the end of that eight minutes and be like yeah this this yard looks really good you know we do the edging we do the blowing and all that kind of stuff but um there's something i feel like you don't get uh with live music in that in that sense where it's like you play all of these gigs and after the gigs you know you can feel good about it that you've completed it but there's no evidence of your work necessarily that that's quite as tangible um so i i really like recording music in that sense because like at the end of the the re recording session you have like this finished product that you can look back on and feel like yeah i accomplished something or even like videos like i i do enjoy um i i don't necessarily enjoy like the minutia of video editing and all the hours that go into creating content like that but i do enjoy like the outcome and being able to look at a video be like i like the way that this turned out editing wise or you know being able to tweak things and learn as you go along to improve at at an art form or a medium kind of like like music is you know just trying to improve by one percent increments uh every time you do it and being able to look back and see your progress as you go along um I don't know something I, I really enjoy about that that i feel like i don't get quite as much from from playing live um do you feel that way too i'm curious well see now i'm i'm transitioning from 10 years of being a live touring musician to to doing this because the band is is taking a, a hiatus mm -hmm. and, uh, you know and it could be a number of years before before i'm touring again um i, I loved touring i love everything about it i love the road i love getting in the van in the morning I love driving to the next town going, where's the nice coffee shop? Uh, <laughs> and I looked after like all the merchandise and even that was exciting. It was like, you know, how can we hack the system to sell more t-shirts and sell more? You know, I, I loved all of it, the cut and, the cut and thrust of it all. And yeah. I, I, I love performing um, and the interaction with the audience. And, you know, there was very little of it that I didn't enjoy. But I have discovered that I, I, I love what you talked about, which is that, you know, when you're when you're when you're nearing the end of the edit and you look back at the video that you've produced and you're going, God, it looks good. And you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and talk I mean the learning curve is steep. Uh, and you know, and I've eventually, you know, kind of created what I'm reasonably happy with as sort of a studio background. And then I upgraded the cameras so that I'm, you know, <laughs> and I and I'm watching lessons by Marcel and is it Paul Davids? He's some European guitar guy and he clearly has like a team of oh, yeah. 400 doing his videos now his stuff is incredible yeah it's so phenomenal so I just I feel like I walked into something and then I was like holy god there's so much I need to learn <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm, I'm, I, my son is 13 and of course he's a YouTuber right as in he consumes enormous amounts of YouTube and you watch one of my videos and he goes dad your video is really boring. Oh no! <laughs> he goes, but, but but I'm going to tell you why. And he he brings me in and sits me down and makes me watch an eight minute uh, Mr. Beast video. Oh wow! Yeah, and I'll do it. I mean, that's Hollywood level stuff, right? But uh -huh. it, you know, the, the scene changes every thirty five fractions of a second. It's like nonstop. He goes, you got to do that. You have to have more angles and you got to change. You can't just be you sitting there for 20 minutes talking to the camera. It's boring. And I was like, God, he's so right. You know, <laughs> it is like an art form for sure. Like, cause you want to be like helpful and you want to be useful. And I like all the videos I grew up that were less than videos were just someone sitting, at, you know, with one camera angle, maybe, maybe you get like two camera angles of the the hands on the instrument, but like, it was just very straightforward. And and then I've, I don't know, I've also tried to do more stuff and had the opposite reaction from folks where they'd be like, there's too much going on. You got to slow things down, make it just one camera angle. So it's like trying to walk that line where it's hopefully entertaining, you know, you want it to be enjoyable to watch and you want to come across um, as enthusiastic and natural and, and, and uh, charismatic in some ways, but also like 
finding a way to make it useful, make it helpful for someone. That's tough, man. Yeah. I haven't figured well, it out yet. I, no, I, I disagree. <laughs> 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 I think you do a phenomenal job. Um, and I've, uh, you've been a huge source of inspiration for me in terms of, I, I was surprised at how I could be, I, I thought I'd be really boring on camera. And then I look back and I'm like, you know, my biggest thing was that when I had this directional mic for my audio, for my vocal, I was like moving around all over the place. And I had to, because I was getting so engaged in the actual teaching, which I didn't think I would sitting in a dark room uh, under a gigantic light, <laughs> talking <laughs> talking at a red light on a camera. You know, but uh, I, do, I enjoy it way more than what I thought I would. That's awesome, man. Yeah, sometimes I think like if someone could see me actually making the video, without all the edits, like just be a fly on the wall during the filming process, it would be an absolute catastrophe. You know, like I would be like, uh, but uh, there is something enjoyable about it though. I do. And I do feel like, um, yeah, it, it's valuable, you know, and it's cool. Like being in some ways on the ground level of, of online folk music education. Um, and, I, and hopefully there'll be a lot more folks who do it as well. And, feels like you know getting to be a part of something different I, saw, I heard Wes Corbett describe it as the as the bluegrass arms race you know for like <laughs> online education getting YouTube channels started and and uh lesson content out there um yeah, but uh there's a, huge, there's a huge amount of it I, I don't I, you don't strike <laughs> me as a guy who uses many who uses many curse words but I I would <laughs> I I I don't have much of my source material because, you know, otherwise you'd you'd run out of hard drives. But I would love to do an outtakes video, which would essentially be me going beep, beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> Most of mine would just be like me, like staring blankly at a wall, trying to figure out what to say. <laughs> that too, that too. <laughs> uh, David, it's been fantastic to talk to you. And Yeah, uh, likewise in there. Where, where, I mean, David Benedict Mandolin is everywhere, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Where can people find out about the Foreignlanders? Yeah, we've got a website, just the foreignlanders.com, all the social media stuff. Um, yeah, we're, we're out there as well. Fantastic. And give my best to Tabitha. I hope I get to meet her again soon. Uh, it's it, it feels like it's been a very long time, but yeah. And, and we've yeah, never met, that, and I, I would love to we'd sometime meet I know. person as well. I actually, I wanted to mention we're going to be in Galway. I think we're supposed to play a show at Monroe's. Is that right? Maybe? Yeah, when's um, that? I might be in April. I don't know if you're around, but uh, One... if we have time before the show, man, we'd love to meet up. I'm 100% here in April. So let's awesome, let's definitely do that. I'll try to get this out. So before before then, it shouldn't be a problem. Awesome, we should man. we should definitely we should have a tune i'd love that that would be so fun man <laughs> I, gary, gary, gary that gary monroe that runs monroe's i i know gary since i'm 15 years old nice man. a long way That's i'm excited before, to before you were born i'd say <laughs> <laughs> way back <man. laughs> awesome david thank you so much yeah thanks Andy. it's great to talk as always <laughs>